I'm a park ranger and strange things happen on the Appalachian trails. To start off my name is Marshall I started my job as a park ranger a little around 6 months ago. I got this job fairly quickly because the other rangers quit 10 months in. I thought it was very odd but the pay is was nice and I've always loved nature and animals so I thought this would be the right job for me. For the first 2 months nothing really happened. It was the middle of summer so besides the annoying buzzing mosquitoes and the restless spiders that would somehow build a full spider web around my jeep everything was normal. On the third month was when things started to get weird. We've gotten reports of hikers gone missing without a trace and stories from campers who talk about hearing weird wailing deep in the woods at night. We thought it to be no more than just a few kids goofing off in the woods or hikers who just wandered off the trail eventually to be found later, but it wasn't that straightforward. It all took a turn for the worst when I got a call about another missing hiker this time. It was close by my cabin so naturally I was selected to go check it out. I planned to walk about 8 miles into the woods so I packed the essentials and began my trek at 1400. It was around the fourth mile I started to see what I had assumed happened. I found the tracks of the hiker but one mile behind him were tracks of what looked to be of a very large feline-like animal except this thing's paw was bigger and wider than my foot and I wear a size 17. I also noticed the impression it had left in the dirt. It barely left one at all. Not only was this thing big, it was stealthy. I walked around more but I found that the beast's tracks had disappeared. I looked around for more but to my shock I found claw marks scaling up a very large tree. This is something that I have never encountered before. This thing was big large stealthy and could scale a tree in one bound. From the looks of it I was horrified to say the least so I unpacked my hunting rifle loaded around and started walking again. Eventually I came upon the hiker's body and man this thing was barely recognizable. I assumed it to be a male no older than 26. It was shredded to ribbons, the arms and legs had been gnawed off sloppy and he had deep claw marks from his collarbone to his pelvis. Through the gashes in his chest I could see that some of his vital organs were missing. I couldn't even stomach to look at his face. His nose was gone and his bottom jaw had been torn off. If he had any expression on his face before he went I can 100% guarantee you that it was pain and fear. This person had suffered a death so gruesome that I couldn't even imagine how much pain he was while his last breath escaped his body. I radioed dispatch and told them my location and decided to stick next to the body just in case any predator tried to drag it off. Dispatch was about 45 minutes away from my location to collect the corpse. But it was getting dark and for those who haven't been in a forest before. The darkness is otherworldly compared to an area with few trees. I wanted to stay with the body I really did but I had fear. I heard a noise in the bushes but when I turned I saw nothing. But that was when a drop came down on my head. I thought it was rain but when I pulled out my flashlight to see what it was, it was crimson red blood. I pointed my shaking flashlight hand towards the top of the tree and my light landed right on it. I don't know what it was but this thing was massive. It had the head of a lion without the mane with blood around its mouth. The body of a tiger with a solid black body ripped like a professional athlete but no stripes. And the glowing yellow eyes that reflected its lust for blood of a panther and the paws that would make a bear's paw look like minuscule. This thing had to be about 6 feet tall on all fours and about 340 pounds of solid muscle. It let out a roar that was a mix of a tiger and a jaguar expect it was deeper and echoed throughout forest shaking me to the core. Making my soul almost leave my body. I knew that no matter what god I prayed to it wouldn't help against this thing. This thing was primal, fierce and from what I had to guess had been stalking this territory for decades. Right when it was about to pounce on me the helicopter showed up with a spotlight and flashed it down on me. As fast as the beast appeared it disappeared without a trace. I was so terrified by the experience I blacked out on the spot. I woke up in my cabin with my boss next to my bedside. He asked me what happened and I told him what I saw. As I was telling him my story I saw a slight expression of fear on his face. 
But after my story he told me I must have hallucinated the whole event due to the shock of seeing such gore. And passed out due to the lack of an overactive imagination. He quickly changed the subject and told me to get some rest and gave me the rest of the week off. On the third month nothing really happened but I started to notice every time I went for expedition or my own hike I would get the feeling of eyes watching me from the top of the trees. Or something following me behind, matching my steps. I started carrying a desert eagle with me but if it was the creature I had seen last month I knew it would be as effective as shooting it with a pellet gun. The next month on a Monday night I awoke to my radio buzzing it was my boss. He had told me that he'd received a call from some campers who strayed too far into the forest and had started to hear wailing in the woods. I thought it to be kids just messing around so I took the job and got in my job. I was on my way. When I arrived at the campsite it was a horror show. The tents were destroyed by sheer force and the camper's car looked destroyed that could only be accomplished by being t-boned by car going 90 in a school zone. But the worst part is I found the campers. Their body parts were all over the campsite and blood stained every area. Knowing better this time I bought a shotgun and loaded it with nothing but buckshot. I put my headlamp on and started searching the area for what could have caused such devastation in such a short amount of time. From my investigation I found footprints of what looked to be of human origin. I followed them thinking that it would lead to a surviving camper but as I followed them they shifted from human to bear. I started to think that the survivor was mauled by bear. I hurried my pace and I saw a man. I nearly yelled for him but something stopped me. Instead I took cover behind a tree, turned off my headlamp and studied the man I found. He was illuminated by moonlight but from what I could see he was tall, very tall. He looked to be about 7 apostrophe 0. He had long arms, long hair and long legs. He had a athletic build. His hair was very long and dark reaching to the middle of his back and he wore a bear skin coat. He turned back somehow knowing he was being studied but by a blink of an eye he missed me. He turned back around and started walking. I followed him wanting to know if he was with the campers. He took about 10 steps before something started happening to him. He doubled over on his hands and knees and sounded like he was in pain. I wanted to rush over to help him but before I could he let out a otherworldly roar. He slowly shifted from human to a gigantic monstrous bear. He looked to have grown to 9 feet and sported a scar on his face. He was the size of a SUV and had red eyes that glowed in the night. Faster than anything I've ever seen he took off deeper into the forest running over tree as if he was a bulldozer running through cardboard. My heart was racing and I was pale as a snow. I didn't move until it was sunrise and then I booked it back to my cabin and notified my boss about what happened. I didn't tell him the part about the man bear instead I told him that a bear had mauled the campers. He accepted my report and I sat on my bed the rest of the day thinking about what I have gotten myself into. It's the sixth month and it might be my last month alive. I'm in my cabin. All my furniture against my door while an angry creature is trying to get in. I have nothing but my shotgun and a few rations to last me but from the looks of it I might not make it though night. If I survive I'll be sure to post more about my job but for now the thing at my door has broken through my dresser and my couch won't hold it back for long. Hello guys, I just wanted to let you know that I killed the bastard. The fight was tough, but I did it. But I got up and immediately collapsed from blood lose I guess. I woke up 4 days later in a hospital. My fight resulted in 2 broken ribs, dislocated shoulder, and scar across my chest. Adrenaline is a hell of a thing to have I guess. While looking at the scar on my chest the door opened and a nurse, tall blonde beautiful nurse with glasses and blue scrubs came in and said in a southern accent hey sleepyhead look who decided to finally wake up. She chuckled. I gave a hearty laugh and said well I guess I'm like sleeping beauty and you're my princess charming. I should go back to sleep so you could give me a kiss to wake me from my slumber and ended it with a wink. The nurse then replied while blushing and laughing so charming, while you were asleep a man came by and left you this note. 
If you need anything else sweetheart just let me know my name is Melinda by the way. She said with a wink while walking out the door and shutting it slowly behind her. The letter looked like something from a high-ranking government organization with gold edges around it and an odd-looking stamp on it. The front had the letters HC on it. Strange I thought to myself. I opened it and it read the following. Good morning Mr. Dot Dian we heard about your little scuffle you had with a very big bear four days ago we just want you to know that everything is okay. The problem has been taken care of the park is under new management now and 25,000 has been deposited into your account. There is more in the future if you keep up the good work and remember what goes on in the park stays in the park. From Hazard Control. I reread the letter over and over again just to see if it would make sense. This couldn't be real, I checked my bank account and in it like the letter said was $25,000. How did they know about the monster I faced and why are they paying me money to keep quiet? I packed my things got the nurse's number and headed out back to HQ to see what the hell was going on. One two hour drive later and I was back at HQ. I showed up just in time to see men in all black suits with black sunglasses and briefcases walking around and interview the park rangers. I then heard a familiar voice say well if it isn't the man himself. I'll be damned you actually made it out alive. It was my good friend Hector. Me and him have been park rangers together for three years. He and three others are my closet friends. Of course I did. You didn't think that thing could take this I said jokingly while flexing. I then greeted him with firm handshake and a hug. I gritted my teeth a little cause his shoulder made contact with my scar, so you're not made out of steel like I though huh? He said while laughing and patting me on the back. Only some parts of me I replied with a grin. Our friendly encounter was interrupted by two men who were taking our laptops from the offices and putting them into the back of a black van. I tried to run after them to stop them but I was grabbed by Hector. Just what the hell happened while I was gone Hector I asked him angrily. He looked at me with a troubling look and pulled me in for and he whispered we can't talk here they've got eyes and ears everywhere even all of the cabins have been bugged. If you want to talk meet me in the woods at the fire pit at 0300 and I'll tell you everything. We both looked at each other, nodded and he left the cabin but not without patting me on the back. Around 2 o'clock was when I was awoken by footsteps outside my cabin. I peeked through the windows and saw men with hazmat suits body armor, flashlights, and our 15s patrolling the grounds. What the hell happened while I was gone I then thought to myself. Hector I hope you know what you're doing around 250 was when I snuck out a window and booked it to the forest without anyone finding out. Me and Hector meet at the campfire and walked 5 miles into the forest just to be safe. He led me to a small cabin with a fireplace and a mini kitchen. We walked in and we both took a seat at the table. He pulled out a cheap looking laptop from a bag and a flash drive out of his pocket. I saved all the reports of what has happened while you were gone strange thing been going on while you've been gone take a look. He faced the laptop towards me and got up to close the blinds in the cabin and locked all the doors. There were two reports that stood out to me. The first one was under the report named the the doll maker the ranger assigned to this was Chaska. He was given the assignment of investigating a very strange case while I was gone. There was escalated reports of hikers going missing in a certain area of the forest. Some rangers would say that while on late night patrols they would hear cries for help and cries of pain deep in the forest. Chaska didn't waste any time taking up this case and set out to go into the woods. Around the four mile mark he started finding strange tracks in the forest. Not quite human but not animal it was like a mix between the two. Things only got stranger when he started finding bloody hiking equipment. He then started finding body parts which included a human tongue, two right feet, and a severed leg from the thigh down. The weather that day has a forecast for a thunderstorm so he knew he need to find shelter. He then found an abandoned cabin deep in the woods. Thinking to himself whether he'd brave the rain or stay dry he went with the ladder and decided to go into the cabin. 
In the report he claimed that this was a strange cabin instead of being old and run down the cabin was free of dust and cobwebs. And looked as if someone or something had been living here taking care of it. He walked down the hallway and found a bed and decided to camp the night out in the cabin. He unpacked his bag and started to inspect the cabin. He walked around the cabin looking at all the well-kept furniture. He noticed that the floor had been recently swept that was when he noticed deep claw marks in the floor leading to the basement. The door had been left cracked and downstairs he smelled a strong smell of iron. He heard humming coming from downstairs. He took his gun and flashlight and walked downstairs, slowly made his way downstairs and noticed how dark it was. He found a light switch and turned it on. The room was a filled with body skinned and hung on the wall. These must have been the missing hikers, their faces had the look of fear and shock glued on it. Fresh blood flowed on the concrete floor. He noted that he slipped and fell unconscious but was awoken 30 minutes later by the front door open with great force. He heard screaming coming from the hallway. He turned off the light hit under the stairs, gun still drawn. He then described what happened. What made its way down the stairs was a man. No woman? No. Something that simply mimicked the human form. Dragging behind it was a hiker male who couldn't have it been over 27. His screams had stopped I guess he got knocked out on the stairs coming down. The creature looked like the photo of that thing from the Russian sleep experiment. It was tall, gray, and had long extremities. Its hands ended with sharp claws that sharped the ground and its face had no lips nor had eyelids. It was completely hairless and sharp jagged teeth that showed through a continuous manic smile. It had a shrill childish voice mimicking that of a young female child but had no obvious features that gave away age or gender. It spoke my dolly is missing an arm and I need to make to a new one. Will you please help me? It asked the man knowing that he wouldn't respond. The creature then hung the man feet first from the ceiling and walked to a bench and took out what looked to be a very long sharp jagged knife. The creature started sawing at the man's arm. He awoke and started screaming careful now you'll wake up Dolly. The creature said while laughing mockingly at the man. He either died from blood loss or passed out from shock because after the creature was done he didn't move. The creature then made its way to old time radio and started playing a distorted version of tiptoe. Through the tulips he couldn't see what it was doing but from the way it looked the creature was sewing something. When it was finished I was terrified at the sight. It was a doll that stood three feet tall. Made completely out of human flesh. The sight almost made him gag and vomit but he couldn't blow his cover. The creature then smacked the radio and it started playing living in the sunlight and it started dancing with the doll. Blood was spraying everywhere and the doll came undone. Not only was this creature taking body parts it was taking organs because what spilled out of the doll was a human heart and liver. Dolly. The creature exclaimed you dropped your organs again. Looks like you'll need new ones. It mad a evil grin towards the man while picking up the knife. The ranger though he had enough he booked it up the stairs Dolly look we've found you a friend why don't you go say hi the creature said cheerfully. The ranger's blood went cold as he turned behind him and saw the doll attempting to replicate running coming up the stairs after him. The ranger took a shoot and the doll creature fell down the stairs. He knew he had to act fast so he quickly ran to the room and unpacked some matches and rubbing alcohol. He doused the cabin as much as he could and lit a match escaping the cabin with his life. He turned back and from the window he saw the creature in one and the doll in the other window waving goodbye to him. The ranger was found two miles from HQ dehydrated and in a state of shock. When he was treated he talked to the head ranger about what he saw. After that meeting with the head ranger it is said by some rangers he was approached by two men in black suits and taken to a site off base to talk. When he returned he was different. He was more quiet and reserved. Some rangers say he spends most of us time in the woods away from other rangers. I looked up at Hector in a cold sweat he nodded at me and said it gets worse to Ash read the second one. With great hesitation I clicked the next file. The title of this one was The One Who Wanders the Woods. 
The ranger assigned to this one was named Adriel. He was given the task of investigating reports of a shadowy figure lurking in the woods at night. He decided to start his mission at 3 o'clock. He reported to the area where the figure has been spotted around 3.50 he spotted the figure and tailed it to a small cabin. As soon as he walked in, the door slammed behind him. He noticed that the cabin was as bigger on the inside as it was on the outside. The walls had a strange 1940s kind of wallpaper on it. With old paintings of farms and animals, he walked into the kitchen and was greeted by a gruesome sight. The walls were drenched in blood and all the knives, forks and even spoons were covered in blood and clear fluid. He assumed to be cerebral spinal fluid. He then stumbled into the living room to see what I had assumed to be a couple of hikers sitting next to each other on the couch watching a TV with nothing but static on it. Their face had been carved from ear to ear to resemble an everlasting smile. Their eyelids had been ripped off keeping their face in a continuous expression of astonishment. He then studied the living room more and noticed something moving on the staircase and that was when the shadowy apparition appeared before me. It had the form of a tall person, but its arms were too long for its body. Its legs were skinny and unstable looking. It was tall and thin and lithe, its image became clearer, and he could see it in detail. Its eyes were bright red. Its flesh was rotting away, the skin that still clung to the bones was grey and discolored. It basically looked like an awkward zombie. It smiled at him but it had few teeth. The teeth it did have were sharp and bloody. It stepped towards him, it spoke his name. He stood his ground, he could feel it feeding off the fear. He found it hard to stay calm and was petrified. He asked it what it wanted. It just kept repeating his name, over and over and over. It advanced towards him and was in front of him faster than he could blink. It touched his face and picked him up by his neck and threw him through the bathroom door. He fell down and hit his head on the tub. The left a gash in the back of his head. He looked up to see the thing walking slowly and arrogantly towards him. He then took out his flashlight and flashed the creature multiple times. It let out a small yell it then lunged at him and wrapped its large hands around his throat. It laughed and laughed. It laughed demonically, it laughed like a madman, all it did was laugh. The ranger then grabbed a can of hairspray and a lighter and then burned the creature's face. It let go and the ranger booked it out of the cabin. Two days later the ranger was about to report what he found to the head ranger but was intercepted by two men in black suits. The ranger returned to work but hasn't been the same person ever since. Holy s dude I said while leaning back in my chair stretching and rubbing my eyes. These people appeared out of nowhere after your fight with that monster. Since then all strange activity at the park has been amplified Hector said. Do you think it's because of them? Do they have something do with it? I replied I don't know but whatever's happening at our park is also happening at other parks too. Take a look at this. He took the laptop but as soon as he was about to show me what he was talking about we heard a knock at the door. We drew our guns and got ready for confrontation. Who is it? Hector said in a deep voice. It's us ya big dummies now open up replied the voice. It was Chaska and Adriel how did you know we were gonna be here? I said surprised Simon you think we wasn't gonna notice you two missing from your cabins this late at night? We both looked at each other and shrugged and let them inside. They both walked in and kicked their feet up on the table knocking my tea over in the process. Oops said Chaska my bad. You don't look different to me I said while getting up to get paper towels. He then replied. Of course not that's an act I gotta put up for the suit so they don't keep track on me. Now listen boys I know you two have been looking into this but it's bigger than you think it is. He said while rocking in his chair. That's right Ash we've heard that the new guys want to send you, me, Hector and Chaska to Alaska for some team building event within two weeks. Apparently it's coming from high up. Adriel says with his arms crossed focusing on me. I scratch my head for a bit. This is all weird to me all of them have had encounters with something otherworldly and now they're sending us to Alaska for some team building event. Something isn't right here. 
I look at each of them nod my head and we walk out of the cabin back to our cabins where we get ready for our trip to Alaska. I found a journal at a flea market in North Carolina. If you find a roadside bar in Appalachia at night, don't stop driving. Last Saturday, my daughter and I took one of our trips to the flea market a little ways outside our home in Asheville. She's 15, so she ran off to the card and gaming shop at one end, leaving me to take my time browsing the stalls. I ended up taking home a box of restaurant-grade cooking stuff for a good price, those stainless steel heavy whisks can't be beat. When we got home I took everything out to clean it and found a little spiral notebook at the bottom of the box. I've written down what I read in there for y'all here. I woke up for work about an hour before my shift at dusk. I made my way around my part of the duplex as I dressed myself in my worst work clothes. I listened to Audrey snore, still sound asleep from her shift the night before. It felt like it had been weeks since I'd actually seen Audrey. She was always snoring by the time I got home and always gone by the time I woke up. I didn't pass her on my way to or from the restaurant anymore either. I left as sunset faded into dusk, another part of the ritual I participate in every other day. I haven't ever had a specific starting time for my shifts. I've always arrived at dusk and left at dawn and it's always worked. The evenings in the mountains get cold quickly even during late spring. It's a different climate from the rest of the south, so I was still wearing a hoodie on most of my walks to work. I must have left a little later that night, for the sky was already stained purple in the direction of the sinking sun and a smattering of stars was visible behind me. The wooden steps of the duplex were dark and slick with rainwater, so I descended them carefully on my way down to the clearing. The two-story cabin-style duplex that I share with my co-workers sits on the edge of the tree line with its back to untamed wilderness and its front to a meadow that is currently washed with ankle-high yellow flowers the size of my thumbnail. It's beautiful, but I've noticed that walking through the flowers tires me out and makes it hard to breathe. I've stopped smoking on the way to work and it's helped a little. I left too late that night, and I think that was the first rule, although unwritten, that I broke. The flowers weren't bothering me much, but the fog that had settled after the day's rain was. It was making it hard for me to see, and if the restaurant wasn't a straight shot from our quarters, I may have been in trouble. I blamed the feelings of unease that started as soon as my feet left the bottom step on the fog and made my way to work. I knew that it wasn't the fog that had me feeling watched. This had happened to me a few times before, but only when I'd first started and it was trying to scare me. Don't turn around no matter what, I've been advised. The feeling of multiple sets of eyes boring into the back of my head put my hair on end, but it wasn't something that I was unused to. It was a rule that the little two-part door that separated my kitchen from the front of house had to remain open, so I was more than accustomed to having the back of my head watched as I went about preparing orders. If our customers weren't talking to the other staff member or one another, they were watching me. It was the smell that put the pep in my step. If you've ever put your face in a box of old portobello mushrooms, then you won't have trouble imagining the scent that suddenly overpowered the stuffy, wet smell of fog, but the earthy smell was soured by the sharp, body fungus odor that accompanied it. The scent of athlete's foot came in waves that corresponded with the sound of a dragging pair of feet. I had felt it watching, I had even smelled it, but never before had I heard its unique lopsided gait. It sounded like it walked with an injury, and its steps echoed as though placed on a wooden deck instead of the solid, grassy ground. Just as with the smell, the sound appeared without any build-up or steady approach. It was simply absent one moment and unignorable the next. Though I picked up my pace, I didn't run. I knew that if I acknowledged it, it won. It wasn't my job to acknowledge it or anything else, anyway. I just make the food. It continued to thump and drag along behind me, and I started whistling a tuneless song to show it that I wasn't bothered as I speed walked up the hill. The flowers were making it hard to catch my breath and keep whistling, but I persisted. I could see the warm, 
orange glow of the street lamp in the parking lot at the top of the hill, and I relaxed a little but didn't dare slow down. Behind me, an unwanted accompaniment joined my whistling. The sound grew in pitch and reminded me of when my college friend would test her homemade oboe reeds. I jogged the rest of the way. The musk dissipated when I hopped up the step on the back deck to safety, and the fog cleared without warning as well. I slipped through the back door and shut it tight. I leaned against the door and breathed in deep, trying to slow my pounding heart and return to normal. You okay, lil one? I was relieved that Adrian had, for once, arrived before me. He was seated at the bar, counting out his drawer, as I tried to smile and offer reassurance that I was indeed okay. Since he had been here longer than any of us, Adrian probably had a good idea of what happened and didn't question me, instead returning to his count as I straightened up and headed into the kitchen to start my night. Because Adrian and I had the same name, Adrian and Adrian, he had taken to calling me Lil One, which Audrey adopted as well when I would still see her. She and Adrian were good friends, but now neither of us see her much. She works exclusively with the other cook, Avery, who lives on the ground level of the duplex with Adrian. I've never met Avery, but he does a good job closing. Working for this little roadside restaurant and bar comes with more oddities outside of scheduling. We never get shipments or trucks, the food is always stocked, and I only have to do a little prep on my nights. The beer and liquor are always full and ready as well. Even on our busy nights I've never seen Adrian blow a keg, and I've never had to tell him to 86 a menu item. In that regard, it's a very easy job. The customers are what make it difficult, but that's how it always is. Adrian told me that I got lucky after my first week. It was the dead of winter, and slower than usual, so all of our business came by way of weary late-night travelers. One such traveler stuck out. I assumed he was just a peculiar guy with some money and a love of vintage clothes, for he was all bundled up in a long wool peacoat and a plaid scarf. With not much else to do, I leaned on the kitchen door and listened to him make small talk with Adrian as he ate the food I prepared for him. After he paid his tab, he stood and pulled on a pair of leather driving gloves. You know, he said, I drive this route every winter on the way to my parents' house in Landrum, you know where Landrum is? I watched Adrian nod and open his mouth to offer a personal anecdote, but the man cut him off before he could. And I've never seen this place before. You're a fine barkeep. Adrian thanked him, and not long after I heard the front door open and fall shut, marking the departure of the night's only patron. Adrian met me at the door, then telling me that I'd had it easy for my first week. I offered little more than a sarcastic oh really? In response. Being so new to the workplace I was still shy and hesitant in conversation with my new co-workers. This would change a few days later when I witnessed my first seasonal regular. Wet, heavy snow fell over those next few days, and business slowed to a halt. After warming up from my icy trudge to work, I spent my shifts doing not much else besides listen to Adrian talk about his life outside of work. He went on about girls he knew back home, how he couldn't wait to see his daughter and take her to Lake Lure, and so on, which was a pleasantly normal reprieve from this off-kilter place. It was an unusually hostile night, where the snow fell hard and fast and the wind's mournful song was almost louder than the speaker in the kitchen when the unexpected sound of the front door took Adrian's attention from whatever story he'd been telling me. I listened to him greet his customers, ever casual, and didn't bother to stand up from where I was kneeling to scrub the wall under a prep table. I then realized I could smell campfire smoke. The smell grew to overwhelm the rest of the kitchen smells, ultimately becoming so strong that it reminded me of standing right in the middle of a plume of bonfire smoke. I got up to investigate. At first glance, the dining room and bar were empty save for Adrian, who was occupying himself by wiping the bar down. The lights were dimmer than usual, but nothing seemed out of place. My eyes were drawn to the corner of the room closest to the front door though the space appeared to be empty. When my eyes adjusted, I discovered that in the corner, hardly distinguishable from the wooden walls, 
a figure stood unmoving. The bipedal figure was made entirely out of loosely bundled sticks. It had a stiff, handmade look to it, a stick doll the size of an adult man and standing on its own. Its head consisted of long, flexible switches that formed a loop like the eye of a needle. The first one I noticed was accompanied by two others. One stick man stood in the corner by the back door, and the other startled me when I noticed it in the corner to the left of the kitchen door. They didn't do anything but stand there and look unsettling. Adrian ignored them and moved on to washing glasses in the bar sink. I stared at the one by the front door for a while, my mind reeling as I tried to figure the thing out. I felt that I should ignore them too, but something about their presence was mesmerizing. They weren't doing anything, but my eyes wanted nothing more than to stare through the hole in their stick heads. A face should have fit in that blank oval. Anything to fill the negative space. Eventually, they moved. In unison, the stick men left their corners, walking, if you can call it that, with purpose to the corner recently vacated by their companion to the left. Their movement was stiff and awkward and exactly what you'd expect from something with no knees or hips. The bundled sticks that comprised their rudimentary appendages shuddered as they walked, as though a strong wind was blowing through them despite the restaurant's stagnant airflow. The sound that accompanied their steady journey was also that of wind through barren branches, much like the sound of the forest behind the duplex at this time of year. Before they settled in place, I took my attention away from them and found another chore to busy myself with for the duration of their stay. Eventually, Adrian reappeared in the kitchen threshold to tell me they were gone. When I asked him what the hell that was all about, he offered no explanation other than that they came in during snowstorms and were terrible tippers. I haven't seen them again, but the mobile stick men were far from the last strange seasonal regulars. The winter brought more strangely dressed but seemingly human customers, including a peculiar old man without any hair at all and a hooked nose with red spider web cracks at its point. He wore nothing save for navy blue long johns and cleared two full handles of green label Evan Williams in an hour. There's also a party of six creatures with oily feathers, skinny human legs, and blank, white barn owl faces that push two tables together and make a racket all night. They always leave a mess, but Adrian says he makes good money when they come in. Since spring started, a group of three women in sheer black gowns has started coming in to eat and drink. I'm not sure how they do it, for their faces lack visible mouths and instead resemble a long nose theater mask made from thinly stretched, pale flesh. Their eyes are almond-shaped and completely green, devoid of sclera or pupils. Every other night I make food for these creatures and more, some not worth describing and some completely indescribable. The money is good, but it doesn't seem like I'll ever get a chance to spend it on anything. All of my material necessitates are accounted for, so I don't have any reason to work other than that I feel I absolutely have to. Aside from being followed on my way to work by an unseen, mushroom-scented entity, this night was promising to be like any other. I was going through the motions of setting up for business, and Adrian was doing the same. We were laughing and chatting like any other co-workers at any other restaurant, and the terrifying encounter I'd had on the way to work was soon at the back of my mind. It was nearly time to unlock the front door when I heard Adrian let out an exasperated groan. I poked my head out to ask him what was wrong and found him staring at a folded piece of paper with narrowed eyes. I asked him what was up. Audrey couldn't have done a better job at hiding this from me, he said, waving the paper around. Now I got a bust ass to have it posted before opening. What's that? I asked. Just the stupid regulation notice the bosses want posted across the street at the start of every month. I frowned. This was the first I'd heard about that, but it wasn't completely weird given what passes for normal around here. I'll be right back, Adrian said as he pulled on his jacket. A bolt of nervous lightning struck me when I realized that Adrian was about to leave me alone in there. I've been alone at the restaurant before but never for long and never after being antagonized like I had been that evening. I felt like a wimp when I sheepishly asked if I could come with him across the street. 
My unease must have been written on my face for he agreed without hesitation. I grabbed my hoodie from the back and pulled it over my head as I followed him out. Adrian locked the front door behind us, and we stepped off the concrete front patio into the gravel roadside parking lot. The clouds that had dominated the day had returned and were now casting downy shadows over the moon as they moved across the sky. As we approached the asphalt river that the bar banked on, I thought that it looked wider than I remembered. The reflectors through its middle were hardly visible in the cloud cover, and the shadowy shapes beyond the other side of the road were a scrambled mess of black and deep blue. The pool of orange from the streetlight in the parking lot felt like a point of no return the final docking station before a faithless leap into nothingness. Beside me, Adrian sighed, his breath becoming smoke in the chilly mountain air. He clutched my hand without warning and pulled me along across the weathered street. My night vision was worse than I'd expected, for the large tree and its fledgling greenery didn't come into view until we were halfway across the street. The massive, ancient tree stood out from the rest of the tree line, lying in wait for us. When we reached it, Adrian led the way to the side of its trunk farthest from the road, where I noticed a carved hollow at its base. A white, woven basket sat empty in it. I stared at the curious basket as Adrian unfolded this month's rules and prepared to stick them on the tree. I turned my gaze from the basket to the previous rule sheet, which was still pinned to the tree trunk by two nails. The note appeared to have been printed off from a computer, and its words in black ink were discolored and smeared from weeks of weather. Adrian swore under his breath upon reading the last line. It read, in bold font. Come alone. I scanned the rest of the rules, finding them very mundane. They didn't seem to apply to us. I looked up at Adrian with raised eyebrows, but he continued staring at the sheet of paper. What the hell does that mean? I asked. The panic in Adrian's eyes had not yet reached me. He shook his head. How were you supposed to know? I said. I'll take the blame, I reassured him as he tore down the old note and stuck the new one on the nails. How would the boss even find out? It was disturbing me how quickly his jovial demeanor had turned. They might be playing a joke, he said, his voice scarcely a whisper. Yep, come on now. I grabbed his wrist and began leading him around the tree to return to our roadside sanctuary. The light in the parking lot looked so far away from here, like the road had stretched and widened. We had almost reached it when the headlights appeared. The lights were blinding LEDs, those oppressively bright lights that almost looked blue in their intensity. They didn't approach, they only appeared, suddenly and far closer to us than they should have been as though their source had been waiting for our approach to switch them on. They were accompanied by what I believed to be the sound of an idling engine. We stopped short, squinting into the lights, barely making out the hulking, black shape that they belonged to. Adrian stepped back to the grass first, dragging me with him. The thing, which I knew had to be a vehicle, reversed back up the road as we did. I looked up at Adrian, who was focused on the vehicle, glaring at it, daring it to try something. We stepped forward. The truck inched forward with us. It moved effortlessly in time with our steps, posing as a threat and yet lulling us into the belief that its movement was predictable. Adrian backed us up so that we were in line with the rule tree. From that point, the truck's lights were its only visible part, and they illuminated the road before us. Adrian dropped my trembling hand. I heard him say screw it, before he ran out into the high beams. The thing that ran head on into Adrian was neither organic nor machine. It seemed to clip into existence right as Adrian reached the middle of the road, jolting forward on four stilt legs. As its flat, mouthless head and the pale spikes of its antlers made contact with Adrian's body, so small and frail in comparison, the light in its round, blank LED eyeballs flickered. What we had believed to be the sound of an idling engine got louder when it hit him, sounding more like the scream of a mountain lion made by scraping, grinding pieces of metal. I screamed while I watched as my friend was skewered and then tossed over the creature's stretched, fawn-colored back and onto the asphalt. 
the thing continued its lurching sprint down the road, unbothered by the obstacle it had overtaken. My legs buckled and my head became light with the force of the air leaving my lungs and throat in a shocked, fearful wail. I didn't look both ways before I fled to Adrian's side. I fell hard to my knees without noticing the pain and blood from skinning them. As I brushed his brown hair from his forehead, I had to force myself not to look down at the mangled mess of his upper body made by the forceful impact of those antlers. Adrian's eyes were trying to focus while I promised that I would get help and that he would be okay. The arm that hadn't been punctured reached aimlessly around before I caught it, accidentally glimpsing a deep, red-black hole between his ribs. I could hear Adrian croak out something about Lake Lure before he winced and screwed his eyes shut from the pain. He became unresponsive, and my shouts became louder. I must have blacked out not long after. For the last thing I remember before waking up in my bed is apologizing to Adrian. I sat bolt upright, sweaty and teary-eyed, and realized that I could hear Avery snoring from her room. It was only then, as my reality shifted into focus, that I could almost believe that night had been a dream. I tried my best to shake it off and get ready for work. When I left, the sun was setting, and the field of yellow flowers was alive with the whirring chitter of insects and bird calls. It must have been a lovely day judging by the fading sunset colors, not that I'd been awake to appreciate it. Sometimes this secret place is beautiful, but that did little to help the fact that I still couldn't shake the feeling that the events of two nights ago were real and not just some long, horrible dream. My walk to the restaurant was uneventful, even the flowers seemed to leave me alone, and it gave me enough time to decide over a cigarette that if Adrian showed up tonight, I could come to terms with having only dreamt seeing him impaled on the antlers of a monster. Though the emotions I felt upon waking were genuine, they were fading, becoming hazy like dreams do, and taking the dreadful images with them. I wish the walk to work could have been longer, for the sight of the bar at the top of the hill filled me with dread tonight. I took a deep breath before pushing the door open, savoring the last few seconds of uncertainty, knowing that these were the last moments where I would not know for sure if Adrian was alive or dead. Immediate nausea struck me when I found the restaurant empty. I called out for Adrian and checked the bathrooms and kitchen before sinking down on the floor, miserably accepting that he was gone and I'd had a selfish hand in it. After trying to cry and wondering in frustration why my body wouldn't let me, it occurred to me that I could have checked for the scrapes on my knees as proof. Unsure as to why I hadn't remembered that sooner, I yanked my jeans up over my calves and struggled when I got the bunched fabric up to my knees. As soon as the bottom of a fresh scab became visible, I heard the back door close. I startled and looked up at Adrian standing in front of me, completely uninjured, carrying a sweatshirt in the arm that I knew I had seen bloody and broken. Whatcha doing down there? Lil one? He asked, apparently finding it amusing that I was looking frightened on the floor with my jeans bunched up at my knees. Adrian. Relief flooded through me as I pulled myself up from the floor beside the bar. I don't remember all that I said when I started in on him, but it must have included many expletives, questions, and an incoherent recount of what happened, for he was clearly nonplussed by the time I contained myself. The response Adrian offered was the last that I'd expected. He said, that's terrifying, but you know my name's not Adrian. What? Yeah, it's Benny. Stop messing with me, girl, you know my name. We've worked together for months. He started going about his routine for setting up, looking around behind the bar and informing me that Audrey hadn't left any hidden notes for him tonight. I stood there and stared at him, dumbfounded. He headed back into the kitchen to pull the drawer from the safe. When he returned and saw me still standing there, grappling with my own experiences, he asked me if everything was okay. I was lost for words. If you're feeling sick and need tonight off that's no problem, he said, trying his best to help. I shook my head and waved him off. I couldn't deny that, for all I knew about him, he was acting exactly as he would in this situation. His mannerisms, voice, and appearance were the same as they'd been before I'd gotten him killed. 
He even seemed to remember the folded up rule sheet behind the bar and the nickname he'd given me. If I could only accept his insistence on his name having been Benny all this time, I could continue on with my life. So I assured him that I would be fine, and went on to start my work night. I was deep in thought, searching for an explanation or some way to rationalize this turn of events, when Adrian, or Benny, or whoever he is, entered the kitchen. He looked over the shelf above the compartmentalized kitchen sink, searching for something among the cardboard boxes. You can't let this place get to you too much, you know. I used to have vivid dreams that I swore were real, too. But I don't dream anymore. He pulled the stepladder out from beside the standing freezer and climbed up to reach a box of black plastic forks stored on the shelf. I conceded that he was right, therefore admitting that I'd surely only been dreaming. Sure. I'd only dreamt up the scabs on my knees from falling on the street beside his punctured, bloody body. I'd dreamt the antlered, mechanical animal that had hit and killed him. I'd dreamt the last several months where he'd been named Adrian. I dreamt the night we met and laughed when we found out we had the same name. I'd been forced to accept everything else about this place that was horrifying and wrong, so I could accept that I was wrong as well. Right. That's why I've written all of this down. I need a concrete record that I can return to, because I know what I saw, and I am sure of my experiences, but it is clear to me that the entities controlling this place are capable of returning their servants, their employees, from death and rewriting our memories. It's all I can do. I know I cannot escape and will continue working, 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 even beyond death. But they'd have you believe that's what we're meant to do. It's the same for everyone else, so why am I so afraid? That's everything written in there, the rest of the pages are blank. The sensible part of me thinks it's just someone's pet project or something. But there's a reason I posted it here anyway and haven't shown my daughter. Her dad, my ex-husband, disappeared somewhere on the mountain roads when he was coming to pick her up for summer vacation eight years ago. He was planning to take her to Lake Lure. The Stretched People of Appalachia the Appalachian Trail attracts tourists from all over the world. Hiking it is considered a rite of passage to some, but the stunning views are what brought my friend and co-worker Jeremy and me to the Smokies. We trekked out Saturday through the mountain trail in North Carolina, just below Tennessee, eager to witness the wildlife and brilliant fall landscapes. The sun cast warm beams through the spruce firs. The sky was a magnificent pinkish golden hue that resonated within me and filled me with a long lost appreciation for this world. Lovely, isn't it? Jeremy stated. He bit into a granola bar with a hearty crunch, and a few crumbs landed in his fluffy, black beard. He looked like a mid-twenties Santa, rosy cheeks and all. Sure beats the office. I dunno, I kind of miss corporate meetings and the soothing sounds of the broken printer. Jeremy's smile widened. Or Greg scoffing at every email request he receives? Something very zen about that too. Very soul-soothing, he joked back. All right Office Max, let's hit the trail. The September chill was invigorating, although it was a bit colder than I'd dressed for. I pulled up the hood on my jacket and followed Jeremy's lead, a bit surprised at seeing my stocky friend hiking up the incline so effortlessly. This was the first time we'd done anything together aside from knocking back beers over pool games or the occasional meal out. He married young and usually reserved day trips like these for his wife. She was out west with her family this time, and I was happy to oblige his offer. Twigs cracked beneath my boots as I followed Jeremy. The trees were brilliant gradients of orange, yellow and green. Basewoods, dogwoods and magnolias popped in a vibrant, patchwork panorama. It was truly breathtaking, and I appreciated Jeremy inviting me along on the nature walk. But then, an hour in, Jeremy decided to stray from the plotted path. We'd rounded a few narrow dirt paths to reach an overhang where Jeremy wanted to take a photo. It was an exposed face of the mountain offering a clear view of a valley below. 
It was obvious why he decided to take a detour for a photo op. It was gorgeous. I wheezed, a bit out of breath as we finally climbed up the steep ridge. He slapped a gloved hand on my shoulder and I smiled into the phone's camera lens as well. He'd framed a great pic of us with the enormous valley behind us, but then the device slipped from his hand and onto the steep dirt hill. We watched it tumble down into the dense cluster of trees at the bottom. Damn, Jeremy yelled. I really didn't look forward to climbing all the way down then all the way back up again. Is it cool if I stay here while you get it? I asked, eager for a break. My calves were sore and tight, and I was out of breath. Man, you're such an indoor kid, he smirked. I shrugged, I mean, he wasn't wrong. Sure. I'll see you in a bit. I watched Jeremy descend the steep incline, winding down off the path and into the stark shadows of the woods. Just keep calling it so I can follow the ring. No prob, I called back and Jeremy, just a small form among the valley of pines, vanished. I only then realized how utterly isolated this area of the forest was. We hadn't come across another hiker in over 45 minutes and I gathered our little detour from the main trail must have taken longer than I'd thought. Aside from the rustling of leaves and the occasional creaking of swaying branches, it was quiet. A loud snapping sound echoed up from the basin, a tree branch, more than likely. I dialed Jeremy's number and soon after, I heard a very faint ringtone. The phone must have tumbled farther than I realized. I shook my head, well aware his screen was likely shattered and he'd be using mine for photos the rest of the hike. I heard the ringing phone continue for a bit, then stop as it went to voicemail. See it? I yelled down the side of the steep incline. The cold air was starting to numb my cheeks. Winter was on its way. No response from Jeremy. I redialed, then listened to the faint ringing from the deep woods below. When it finally went to voicemail once again, I felt a bit anxious. Jeremy? I yelled down. A woodpecker's rapid knocking carried over the valley from some unseen tree, but no other sound at all. Jeremy, you okay? I shouted down. Only the rattling groans of the trees and occasional cracking of branches was heard from below. I decided to go check on him. Hiking down the decline was easy, but I was well aware the climb back up was waiting. I was careful not to slip as I left the trail and edged my way down into the thick wooded valley where Jeremy had vanished. The pines had looked so small from up on the path, but as I descended, I realized they were enormous. It was a dense wilderness in the basin. Light barely penetrated the intertwined pine needles and leaves. Jeremy, I called out. I should have been within hearing distance, but he still didn't respond. I called his phone once again. It rang, close by. I followed the sound, spotting it a few meters ahead on the forest floor. Sure enough, the screen was cracked, but it had miraculously survived. Then I noticed something white and pearl-like on the forest floor. I walked closer and squatted down to analyze it. My guts shifted and my throat closed a bit as I realized what I was looking at a human tooth. Hey Jeremy, are you okay? I called out. I'd seen him reach the bottom, so I knew he hadn't fallen. Might not be as I thought, and I peered into the endless pillars of tree trunks that sprawled out into the valley. Though hesitant, I decided to walk a bit in. Jeremy, I yelled into the woods. I could hear my own voice faintly echo off the surrounding mountains. I tried to rationalize that maybe Jeremy had just headed a bit inward to relieve himself, but I was getting a bit scared. I felt the fall leaves and pine needles soften my steps as I continued on. I then saw another small, white shape on the ground. It was a bloody human molar, roots and all. The leaves surrounding it were flecked with droplets of fresh, red blood. Any notion of bravery was quickly abandoned due to the fact those teeth landed there recently. I needed to get out of the woods and call the police. I turned back and headed towards the woods edge in a brisk walk, wishing it was closer. I was a good 30 meters in, and I quickened my pace into a brisk jog. 
I felt a wave of relief when I saw his hand around a tree up ahead. Jeremy, I yelled out, but my jog slowed to a stop and my insides went cold. The hand wasn't as far away as I'd thought it was. Its size had created an optical illusion of sorts. It wasn't Jeremy's. It had long, white fingers and bulbous knuckles, and looked distorted as if a normal human hand had been elongated, somehow stretched out to become twice the length. Worry melted into horror as a large, strange head peeked out from the other side of the thick tree. It was horrible. A mess of pale, saggy flesh that clung loosely to an enormous, stretched skull. A bizarre, exaggerated grin that split the face in two was filled with little pointed nubs of teeth, glistening red. There was no visible nose amid the folds of bunched flesh under the eyes, which were the worst feature by far. The eyes were perfectly spherical, white orbs, glossy and wet, that stared at me with eagerness. The way an animal stares at its food. I froze, unable to peel my gaze away from the hideous face that leered at me from behind the tree. It was far too high up as well, nearly eight feet up from the leafy ground, though it was clearly hunched. I took a hesitant step backward, and as I did, it emerged. Long, soap-white arms and legs extended from the cover of the thick tree trunk. With knobby knees and pronounced ribs, it resembled a person suffering from starvation, or perhaps extreme anorexia, yet scaled up to the size of a giant. I stepped back a bit more, my boot squishing into something. I glimpsed down to see a mound of pulpy flesh beneath my boot. It was half of a human hand, a wedding band on the base of a finger missing the tip. It was Jeremy's hand. I then heard what might have been misconstrued as the wind bending those tall trees. That thing was making the sound. It took a long stride in my direction, the horrible gash of a grin dripping strings of saliva in anticipation. I ran. My heartbeat pounded in my ears as I fled. Adrenaline pumped through me as I ran deeper into the dense woods, away from that horrific giant. Wisps of ragged branches scratched my face and snagged my jeans. I soon passed shreds of clothing, chips of bone and clumps of hair. I ran past stripped finger bones and even a meatless femur. All that remained of Jeremy were the inedible parts. I was going to die in those woods. I slowed my pace when I saw movement up ahead in the distance. Two naked figures, slender, absurdly tall and terribly deformed, stalked the woods with the same wide, bulging white eyes and hideous grins. They hadn't spotted me yet. My heart was pounding so hard I feared they'd hear it. I looked back, seeing that long-limbed thing striding forward. I was pinned, my only chance was to hide. I frantically scanned the area and found a wide trunk tree that looked rotted and hollowed near the roots. It seemed like the best shot, so I raced over and squeezed myself into the hollowed base of the tree, ignoring the tearing of my jacket and the burn from scraping my skin in the process. I hushed my breathing and waited as still and as quietly as I could. A few minutes later, the sound of cracking of twigs and crushed leaves drew closer. I watched through a gap in the bark as panic flooded my mind. That strange vocalization sounded once again, followed by another voice from further out in the dense forest. They were communicating. A few other rattlings, throaty sounds were made before I heard the sound of footsteps continue on, getting quieter and quieter as they continued on into the woods. I breathed out in relief, but then the view to the woods was blocked by a long, horrific face. One of those things had leaned down to look into the open gap and was now staring directly at me, just a foot away. It was enormous, twice the height of my own head. Those milky white eyes stared at me, and I was sure these were my final moments. The dripping smile of that creature quivered and it cocked its head slightly to the side. After a few seconds of reeling from the horror of its presence, I understood it wasn't seeing me at all, it was blind. Its breath was rotten and gamey. It wheezed through those small, sharp teeth and stared at me with those unseeing eyes for a few minutes, but it eventually stood, vanishing from my view. I then listened to the leaves rustle as it walked away, off to some other section of the vast forest. 
I stayed in that hollow of the trunk for maybe an hour before I finally braved peeking out. They were gone. I was cautious to make little noise as I backtracked as best I could. I feared I'd lost my way and was heading deeper still, towards those enormous things, but the mountainside soon became visible through the leaves. I'd gotten back to the area I'd found Jeremy's detached, mangled hand, but it was gone. The cell phone was too, as well as the teeth. Nothing remained of my friend. I climbed out of the valley and began my return, all the while making calls to the park rangers and the local police. By the time I'd made it back to the car, it was surrounded by patrol cars as well as an ambulance. Officers, rangers and paramedics were milling about, and they all were eager to question me. I explained the events that had transpired. The police were skeptical, as were the paramedics and rangers, but one weathered older park ranger named Bob took me aside after the statements were made. Bob looked at me with remorse. He then looked out into the sea of trees and spoke. My grandfather told me a folk tale when I was a child. One that terrified me, one he swore was real. The story of the stretched people of Appalachia. It was an old tale of a family that fell into a cave and were trapped, ages ago. Incest and evolution kept them going. The kids with the longest limbs were kept alive, the others used for food. Evolution in the cave took their sight but selective breeding heightened their stature bit by bit each following generation. I wished it to be a scary story to keep kids in line. I never wanted to believe him when he said he saw one in his youth from the mouth of a hidden cave. I never wanted to believe they were real. Bob's eyes grew wide and his voice quivered with fear as he continued, or that they could eventually grow tall enough to get out. What we saw in the mines of Appalachia. Every old timer in Alum Creek has their own version of what happened. Hell, even half the young people think they know how it went down. Don't listen to anyone who wasn't there. It's like that game we used to play as youngsters where you take a piece of yarn tied to two cups and pass it around a circle, repeating some message. Telephone, that's what we called it. Only difference is that in telephone, the story starts as something simple and gets more and more ridiculous as it goes. But this story? It gets more and more plausible the younger the teller. Almost like it's too much to be believed, so listeners correct for realism when they retell it so as not to sound crazy. My own grandson told me the other day that I remember it wrong. That it was all just some tragic accident and an albino bear. Something ain't right about that. 12-year-old kid telling his grandfather what he should and shouldn't remember. So don't listen to the young people. They weren't there. Truth is, most of us old folk weren't there, neither. The way we talk, you'd guess every miner in town was caught up in it all. Like how every boomer will tell you he was at Woodstock. It was only maybe 20 of us. Of those, a sight more than half are dead and buried. Except for old ROS she sang bastard had himself cremated. I'll start over, you'll forgive me if I repeat myself. 1956. Like near every other young man, I worked the mines. Hard work, but honest. Plus, nothing else paid as good. Nothing I was qualified for, at any rate. And I had a wife, one child, and another on the way to support. Besides, my friends were miners. Ralph Hatfield, Rosnick sang, and Sid McNamara. We'd usually hit the bars after work, me leaving early on account of the family, and ROS she would order juice. Now, Ralph didn't much care for the bartender. Most of us didn't. Jesse felt tended bar not because he was especially good at it, but because he didn't have the stomach for man's work. He even hired kids to mow his lawn and do landscaping. Wasn't ashamed of it, neither thought it made him smarter than the rest of us. I don't know if I ever caught Jesse in town without some full sideways grin. Ralph suspected that Felt got his job by sleeping with the widowed bar owner. I didn't think so, but it wasn't impossible. Jesse had taken the first fruits, if you'll beg my pardon, 
of at least two girls in town and had nearly half a dozen ex or current lovers. He was smooth with women and had a pretty face. High cheekbones, sharp nose. That was enough reason for most of us to dislike him. Ralph had more claim to hate felt than most. Y'all who aren't from West Virginia probably know all about the Hatfields and McCoys. But that's water under the bridge compared to the Hatfields and the Felts. See, during the Cold Wars, Hatfields fought for the unions and Felts owned the mines. But if you gave Jesse a hard time about it, he'd come back with some quip. Felt was always a funny guy. That, combined with the fact that he never got angry, kept the rest of us from truly hating him. Save Ralph. June 10th was when it all started. Cicada season. They were bad that year, too. So many damn insects you could hydroplane on their guts if your tire treads were bare. The mine was a haven from them. For the work day, at least, you didn't have to listen to the never-ending screech. But this season the mine was even worse than the outside. It echoed. It isn't even pretty sounding like a cricket. Least not to me. So it's no wonder we worked deeper in than usual. We got far enough that we couldn't hear a peep and went to work. A couple hours into the day, I spotted a neck into a new room. But this one was real narrow. As in too narrow for most folks to fit through. But R.O.S. she was a skinny guy and could damn near fit through the bars on a baby's crib. Anytime there was a crack the rest of us were nervous to slide through, Sang had it covered. We waited around for no more than 10 minutes before R.O.S. she squeezed back towards us. I'd never seen the man so excited. Stop all other mining, he said with a thick accent. It's a treasure room. In most mines, the demolitions expert calculates the proper amount of black powder and then everyone draws straws on who has to light the fuse. But most mines didn't employ Sid McNamara. The craziest son of a bitch I ever knew, Sid did all the blasting himself. He loved to be as close to the explosion as sanity allowed. Most of us figured he'd go the way of his Ireland-born grandfather and die in such a blast. But he blew the neck wide open without a vent and we all had a look for ourselves at R.O.S.G.'s treasure room. What we saw was a gold mine. Well, no, it wasn't. It was a coal mine. But it was a hell of a lot of coal and mighty easy to collect. The owner was ecstatic. He hired everyone in town not already working for him at twice the normal rate. Even felt couldn't resist a few weeks of hard labor for that kind of cash. We worked like dogs all week, taking as many hours at double pay as possible. Predictably, Jesse was the laziest of us all but we needed him to have enough energy to pour our drinks after work so no one said a thing. Now, I'm not sure who saw it. I want to say it was Felt who came strutting back with a proud smile to tell us all of his find. If my memory serves and it was Felt, that's what they call cruel irony. Anyway, Felt or whoever it was found yet another neck, one wide enough that anyone could walk through. The new room was small, but filled with coal. Loose coal, too. That should have made us wary. Coal doesn't just sit on the surface, stacked knee deep, ready to be scooped into bags. But we were greedy. And now we had two rooms to work. A handful of guys I barely knew worked the smaller room. We called it the pirate's chest. I'll admit we were greedy. We robbed pillars and were too aggressive with the cutting machine. But that room should not have collapsed. I've been in natural collapses before. This was not one of them. Some of the miners will tell you that everything was quiet and normal like right up until the cave-in. But no, there was one sound. That sound haunts me even still. Most rational explanation is the men in the pirate's chest shouted before the rocks gave way. But I know what I heard. It was a scream, all right, but not a human one. It wasn't a shout of anger or fear. If you ask me how I figure a demon might yawn, I'd tell you I don't have to guess. I know. That sound? That was us waking something up. Something buried under all the coal. The three or so men working the treasure room got sucked under that big pile of black like there was some giant hoover underneath. Then the collapse started. 
It was the big chamber that went first. The one me and my buddies were working. That hallway Sid had blasted out fell in on itself without so much as a groan to warn us. Most were able to run through the corridor in time and make it out. A couple were buried in the rubble, crushed flat as pancakes. Hooper Collins had his leg pinned under a boulder which would be the death of him. 19 or 20, I think. Guy had a pretty wife and no kids by her yet. Death sure knows how to pick him. Anyway, when the dust cleared and I was through coughing I noticed poor Hooper hollering and screaming. I did my damnedest to roll the rock off his femur. Hadn't finished before Ralph screamed and pointed. Couple of the new recruits had rushed into that small room to avoid the boulders. Stupid bastards. Now, the screams I heard next definitely were human. I didn't watch, but you can't mistake the sound of flesh being yanked apart. So I gave up on Collins and ran for the rest of the survivors. I've tried to forget how he begged me not to run. The words he used. I've failed at that. I ran. Not far just around a corner, and soon every healthy body was huddled around the cave-in, desperately tried to dig out. It was futile, but I jumped in anyway. What else could I do? When the scream stopped, the eating began. It must have gone on for half an hour. Tearing, cracking, suckling. We all knew what the entree was, and each of us dug all the faster. Eventually, of course, the panic wore off and we had time to think. What was back there? More importantly, what would it do when it finished its meal? And we all knew that we hadn't made progress escaping. West Virginians are just stubborn, I guess. As horrifying as the rending sounds were, the silence was far worse. The dinner was done. Hopefully, it was filling. Damn it, everyone stop. We need to figure this out, screamed Sid McNamara. The Irishman held up his lantern and we all faced the light. Over a dozen of us were huddled, some crying, others had shat themselves, but all of us were shaking as if naked in a blizzard. We took a break from the frantic digging and shut up for a moment. All but Rodney, the preacher's son, who fell to his knees and wouldn't stop praying no matter what the rest of us did. Rodney wasn't half as holy as his father, but at least one of us asking heaven for help couldn't have hurt. Finally, someone spoke. Ralph Hatfield. He always had a clear head, even did a couple years of college. He kept his voice lower than Sid had, what with the creature right around the corner, so we leaned in. It'll take days to dig ourselves out. That thing'll get us if dehydration doesn't. And it's guarding the TNT, if that becomes our only option. We can post a watch? Guards to make sure it doesn't come in here. It was Jesse what said it. Trying, poorly, to maintain his composure. Are you volunteering? You'd rather stand around than dig like the rest of us? Said Ralph. No, I most of the water and lights are in the room with it, said Sid. We've got it outnumbered. Can it die? Of course, said Ralph. I read a whole issue on undiscovered species in the National Geographic. Most life in the ocean is unknown, and there's all sorts of cave creatures we never knew about. This thing is an animal. Animals can die. What's it eat, then? I asked. No one responded for a minute, then Ralph nodded. The coal. Coal's energy, too. Made of carbon, just like living things. There's beasts out there that digest minerals. They call them lithophiles. Now, I can't speak to the accuracy of Ralph's claims or even the exactness of my memory, but I'd like to think Ralph was right. It was an animal. Don't know that I believe it, though. Around that time, Rodney stopped muttering and shouted at us. It's no animal. It's no natural thing at all. Shut up, man, hissed Sid through his teeth. It's a demon, drawn to our greed and wickedness. Rod, please said Jesse Felt, in a whisper. We need to repent. We need I think it was Sid that walloped him in the back of the head. Not hard enough to knock Rodney unconscious, but with plenty of force to knock him over and shut him up. Damn, I said, and a few of us took a step back. 
Right away, ROS she knelt to tend to Rod, giving McNamara a sharp glare. No one else seemed to care. I don't know of many animals that can survive being hit with eight pickaxes, said someone whose name and face I can't recall. Nine, by my count. It was Ralph. He didn't have to tell us the math, that there weren't enough axes for everybody. Rod could barely walk, and Paul had a broken arm, which left me and two others to fight with rocks. Sang was a little luckier. He kept this special blade on him everywhere he went. They call it a kirpan and it's this longish dagger with all sorts of ornament. In the 50s in Appalachia, a knife wouldn't bother anybody. Shoot, back then it wasn't uncommon for a guy to walk through town with a six-shooter on his belt. None of us had a gun, of course, but I would have traded my rock for a good knife any day. Biggest threat here is going to be friendly fire. Who was the fella who said that? Hmm, can't get his name. I remember his stories, and that he'd been a sergeant in Korea. Damn. Age is a hell of a thing. Anyway, the vet advised us a bit. Watch where you swing, but don't stop hitting it until it stops moving. We quickly drew up a battle plan with Sarge's help. Who'd approach from what angle? Pairing up with battle partners. The longer we waited, the more we feared we'd lose our nerve. That the creature hadn't made a sound for so long only added to our worries. Was it planning something? Was it even smart enough for plans? As a unit, we rounded the bend and shined our lanterns best we could. Half the standing lights were out, and of the remainder most were knocked over. Little strips of white shined in random directions like some sort of plaid pattern. But unless it was hiding in the shadows? No creature. Blood and gut trails told a story. That the thing had drugged the dead into the pirate's chest to feast. Hooper's leg was still pinned under the boulder, but there was no sign of the rest of him. No one was eager to be first in line, so we crept towards what had to be the monster's lair real slow. Weapons raised. About halfway there, something dropped onto us. Or rather, onto Sarge. We hadn't figured an attack from above, so the whole plan was shot. Half of us ran, half attacked, I did a little of both. Before I go farther, I'll try my best to describe the creature. Just keep in mind this was nearly 30 years ago, it moved faster than a rabbit, light was scarce, and I only ever got a real good look at it once. At least with my eyes. Can't count how many times I've seen it in dreams but I suppose I saw it well enough for any man. I'm certain it was tall, but how tall I can't even guess cause it was bent over with the twistiest damn pretzel of a spine I ever saw. At least four legs and as many arms, and at the end of each limb a dozen fingers. Or maybe they were antenna? Tentacles? Those spindly legs on a shrimp? I don't know. I know it didn't have eyes. I remember that well. It only had one thing on its head. The mouth. A cross between the tail of an earwig and a crocodile's maw. But boy, was it skinny. Too skinny, for how strong it was. And the flesh didn't look so tough. Translucent. Almost worm-like. Fortunately for it, it had armor. Chitin, I think it's called, if it was a bug. But the plates intersected more like the shell of a crawfish. Any more description would be stretching the truth on my part. Whatever it was, insect or crustacean or demon, it tore the sergeant apart in seconds. I couldn't bring myself to charge in close, so I threw my rock at its head. May as well have thrown a beach ball. Even the axe swings of hardened men weren't making cracks in the carapace. I grabbed the pick sarge had dropped, or had his hand been lopped off? Either way, I almost stepped in when the thing grabbed Ralph. I'd like to think I would have helped if R.O.S. she hadn't acted first. Sang stuck that holy dagger of his into the monster easy as cutting cake. Your guess is as good as mine why it worked. Maybe the dagger was better quality iron than the picks. Maybe something else. But the thing recoiled without making a sound and Ralph was free. Lucky stab or not, two more bodies lay at the thing's feet and there was nothing to do but run again. At least, 
That's what everyone thought who wasn't Sid McNamara. In the ruckus, he managed to find and light a stick of dynamite. Keep your distance, boys, he shouted, running back to the fight. Don't get any romantic notion that Sid was a martyr. I knew the man as well as anybody, and he had no intention of dying. Just like he had no plan to slip on a pile of guts, twist his ankle too bad to stand, lose his grip on the explosive, and fail to catch the monster in the blast. All but one or two of us cleared the explosion, not counting Sid, who went out like everybody had guessed but in circumstances an oracle couldn't have predicted. At least we were alive. Our eyes and ears were none to happy. But the monster seemed worse off, skittering about in random directions, tripping over itself. A sound-driven creature, blinded by the noise, maybe. It didn't even react to Rodney screaming for heaven to save him. We didn't have time to play guessing games, or grieve our friend's death. We had to leave. Ralph spotted our way out. A chimney blown open by the blast. We'd have to brave the middle of the room, praying the monster would avoid us with its random shuffles. And it would take two men to reach the opening, one on the shoulders of the other. What choice did we have? We went for it. I recall Jesse felt weeping as he climbed onto my back, and for a moment I judged him for it. Until I realized I was crying, too. To his credit, Felt found a ledge once through the opening and did his best to pull the rest of us up. Halfway through, Felt and Sang and a couple others having reached safety, the monster grabbed someone. Matthew Stewart, I believe. No one watched him die. And no one tried to help him. I confess feeling a bit of relief, thinking the catch will distract it long enough for us to climb. A sinful thought, sure, but I've committed worse. Eight or nine of us were left, and of those two had lanterns. We shined them upwards, and would you believe that we couldn't even see the roof? I don't know the odds of that. A passage appearing right above us. Straight shot to the surface. Praise Jesus, we've been delivered, said Rod. No one could really argue the point. We climbed. I don't know for how long. It was tiring work, but adrenaline's a powerful thing. At first, we braced our backs to one wall and used our legs along the opposite. Then it turned into more like a steep slope we had to scale with our hands. A few outcroppings gave us chances to rest. Sometimes, the mouth would widen, and we could offer support to the weaker men. Others, it would narrow and we'd have to squeeze through one at a time. In one such shaft, we lost a man. A wide frame can be a blessing or a curse in a mine. And Liam was just too stout to fit. Even with someone pushing from under and pulling from above. It didn't take long until Liam was wedged so tight, he couldn't even go back down. He would have needed to break his shoulders to move. Ralph offered to do just that yank his arms out of their sockets, that is. And keep on climbing how? Liam asked. Then, still stuck, the man pulled out a pocket knife, and cut his own throat. No. Rodney screamed, and all I could think was how fortunate I was to be above him rather than below. It did take breaking his arms to dislodge his corpse. He didn't mind, just fell ten feet before sticking someplace else. There'd be time to pray for his soul later. We kept on for as long as we could, which wasn't long. No, a few minutes later and we came across the worst thing any of us ever had seen, not counting the monster. The ceiling. On cue, one of the lanterns went out. It can't be, whispered Rodney. We're trapped. The odds of it coming out to the surface were always slim, said Ralph, no emotion in his voice. I just wish we had a few cigarettes to share. What time is it? I asked. Dark, probably, by now, said Ralph. Then they'll send somebody. Where Jesse's confidence came from, I can't say. But I envied it. Maybe there's already a rescue party digging through the rubble. We'll all be home by morning. Is that what you want, Felt? It was Ralph. All our friends and fathers getting themselves killed? No, of course not, come on, Hatfield. I just mean shut up, 
said Ralph, and he did. No one said much of anything for the next hour. A few sobs, even a couple grim chuckles. I reckon most of us accepted the inevitable in that time. A small part of me held out hope for rescue. There was no way to warn the rescuers, if anyone was coming. Nothing to do at all but wait and make peace with our creator. Then the last light went out. I doubt you've ever experienced a dark like that one. Sure, maybe you've experienced pitch black. Maybe you've been underground. But I'm talking about the kind of dark that fills your insides. Where even a pair of eyes three inches from yours don't glow. The kind of dark so deep you know you won't ever see light again. The little room we'd sat ourselves in felt an awful lot smaller all of a sudden. And the rocks scraping my back became harder to ignore. There's no one on this earth who I'd wish that sort of death upon. Being buried alive. I would have traded anything just to stretch my arms out. In a way, it was almost like drowning. I'd nearly drowned, once. Twelve years old, tried to impress Susan by swimming across a lake. It was fun, at first, until it hit me like a baseball bat how much water was between my feet and the lake's floor. I remember clearly how oppressive all that water felt as my head sunk under it. An older girl saved me, then, and I didn't even have the wherewithal to be embarrassed by that. Dying underground was similar. All the stone above and below me for who knows how far. But no 11th grader was coming this time. Of all the things to reach out in mercy, it was the moon. A little stream of blue light above our heads. Took our eyes a bit to adjust and even make the light out. I thought I was hallucinating, until felt shrieked in joy. The chimney did go all the way to the surface. But only a tiny slit. Not near enough to scurry up. It was like Artemis herself was teasing us. That's the moon goddess, right? Right. I can do it, said R.O.S. She. The hell you can, snapped Ralph. Hey. R.O.S. She placed a hand on Ralph's cheek. I can do it. Have faith. Okay, said Rod. I have faith. Sang took off his boots and his jacket, spit on his palms, and steeled himself. R.O.S. She. I said. I have faith, too. I'll be back, he said. With a whole bunch of people. And guns, added Ralph. R.O.S. she smiled. And guns. Before he left, he paused. I thought he was second-guessing himself, then he handed me his knife. I thought your religion said you always had to carry this. Sang just laughed. Then up he went. We couldn't see him climb, mine. He blocked out the light. But we listened for minutes as he wiggled through the impossibly small opening. At some point, his grunt stopped and I feared he'd suffocated himself. But then he shouted down to us. I made it. I'll be back soon. There still wasn't much conversation as we waited, but at least it no longer felt like drowning. Thank you, thank you. I'm done with drinking. I'm done with gambling. I'll never stray from my wife again, Rod prayed. Speak for yourself, said a fella I can't remember. First thing I'm doing when we get out of this is having a cold beer. Make that three. A few of us laughed, a lot louder than the joke was funny, but then I heard it. Shh, I said, and everyone clammed up quick. The air wasn't quiet, though. We could all hear it. Liam's flesh, tearing then being swallowed. No, 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 said Rodney. We've been delivered. Why is it back? We were delivered. Sang's coming with guns, said Felt. He'll make it back fast. It took that thing a while to eat the poor fellas last time. We have time. It had more than one body to eat last time, said Ralph. What if it finishes before R.O.S. she returns, hmm? I'm not sure if I thought of it on my own, or if it's what Ralph was trying to imply. But a way to buy us a few precious minutes crossed my mind. I didn't voice the plan, though. It was just too damn mean. Rodney voiced it for me. An offering, he said. That thing down there. It's a devil. 
A demonic spirit. We don't know that, said Ralph. Rodney continued. It's a demon if there ever was one. Demons are drawn to wickedness like moths to a flame. Someone brought it here, and only an offering will satisfy it. An evil offering for an evil thing. What are you trying to say, Rod? Asked Jesse Felt. No one answered, for a moment, but the silence was broken by a bone cracking. Marrow being sucked. Monster was wrapping up his meal. Maybe you're right, Rod, said Ralph. Maybe this devil has wanted a sacrifice all along. Come on, Ralph, you don't believe in that sort of superstition, said Jesse with something that may have been a chortle under different circumstances. Oh, I'm not sure what I believe anymore, felt. But I know that thing is hungry. And I've got a pretty strong notion who the most wicked man among us is. He comes from a long line of wicked folk. The next minute or two is a blur. Probably cause I've tried to block it out. But like most everything I've tried in my life, I didn't do it well enough. Please understand. I don't remember laying a finger on felt. Cross my heart and swear on my children, the way I remember it I stood back and watched. Even tried to reason with Ralph and the others to leave felt be. I've gone over it a thousand times in my head. Maybe a hundred thousand and I still don't remember myself as a murderer. But maybe the mind is more powerful than the soul, able to change memories as are too horrible to recall. Because I do remember my knuckles stained in blood, half mine and half his. I remember looking at that flat as a washboard face, the punches of a dozen men having removed any evidence of Felt's high cheekbones and pointy nose. I remember how he looked white as marble in the moonlight. I remember his screams, is why, why, and, fellas, stop. Fellas. And I remember when words were replaced by pitiful gargles. Much worse than the creature, it's that memory which haunts me. I can forget it most days, but I remember every night. Whiskey helps. A little. And that's how you know if the old timer telling you the story was actually there. That's how you can be sure. Before we toss the body down the hole, we nodded to each other in a silent pact not to tell a soul what happened. We weren't even supposed to talk about it with each other, that was the unspoken vow. So if somebody knows about Felt, they were there, no mistake. I've often wondered if I could have stopped it. I knew it was wrong and I remember protesting some. I had the dagger. And I knew it didn't care for loud sounds. Could be if I was braver I could have used the knife and the knowledge to fight the monster off. But if I'd stood in the way of the mob, would they have killed us both? Nah, however you cut it, I was a coward. Am a coward. I would have buckled for sure. I just wish Sang hadn't left for help. He wouldn't have let it happen. R.O.S. She was a good man. Made good on his word, too, but the guns proved unnecessary. The rescue party never came across the creature, coming straight back to the crag and digging us out. I'm guessing the monster left when it felt so many people milling around above. But it wasn't in the mine, when the townsfolk went back in to recover what little was left of the corpses. Most the survivors skipped town, moving with barely a goodbye to the friends and relatives they grew up with. One came back, eventually, but the rest I never saw again. It was just as well. With the biggest mine shut down, there was less work. The owner of the mines talked about reopening a time or two. Clearing the rubble. Most the workers threatened to strike if he did. I'd switch trades by then. Spent the next 20 years in lumber. But the mine's still buried. Way I hear it, kids go up there sometimes. To the collapsed mine. See who's brave enough to hike in and touch the big cursed rock pile. Parents say it's dangerous. Cave-ins and rattlers and such. Grandparents say it's dangerous, too, but for different reasons. It's still out there, somewhere. Maybe it's found another cavern to call home. Or maybe it never much liked being underground, and lives in some forest. Before we came along, my guess is it was trapped and we loosed it upon the world. Guess I'll never know. 
Not sure that I'd want to. I'll be dead soon. In a box or an urn. Maybe ROS she had the right of it. Buried things have a tendency not to stay buried. I'd have myself burned, too, if it wouldn't cause an uproar at the church. Funny. Why should I care? Probably stepped inside that building less than a hundred times, and those just for weddings, funerals, and Easter Sundays. There'd be a scandal all the same. I never made much trouble alive, I figure no use in starting after I die. Telling you the story, the whole story, even the worst bits, is my kind of penance. People should know what's out there in the dark as much as they should know what we did. On Judgment Day, when I have to look felt in the eye and make account of how I've lived, things I've done, at least I can say I told it like it happened. Not until the end, of course. I guess I kept quiet about my sins during the golden years. So if the good judge sees fit to damn me, well, I guess I can't protest all too much. Maybe, in whatever hell I'm heading for, I'll meet the creature again. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.